I'm Michael Bailey. I'm an engineer, an Android engineer at American Express. Um, we've got a booth out there, so feel free to stop by. We have t-shirts like this one that you can have. Um, we also have stickers. Of course, we're hiring. Um, so stop by and say hi uh, to me or one of our engineers. Um, look forward to see you out there. Uh, you can find me on, on Twitter. Um, if you, after this talk, have some Android tips or tricks that you want to share with me that you, th you think are your favorite, we'd love to hear them. Feel free to send them to me on, on Twitter. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, uh, at YogaDurl. So today I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, Android Studio. Um, by now, I assume everybody is using Android Studio. Nobody is. We're long past the days of Eclipse. Eclipse is a distant memory. Um, I first gave this talk uh, at the very first uh, DroidCon NYC, or I, I gave this talk at the very first DroidCon NYC. And at the time, I was talking about Android Studio version 0 0.5. Um, so it wasn't 1.0 yet, um, and it's, it's made a lot of progress in the, in the last uh, four years. All right. So Android Studio. Of course, it's based on the IntelliJ open source platform, um, which is where it gets a lot of the rich editing uh, functionality. So a lot of the great things and some of the ones I'm going to talk about today come through uh, IntelliJ as the baseline platform, which means that any IntelliJ-based IDE, uh, you are going to get those same editing uh, functions. So if you're a polyglot programmer and you need to do JavaScript or .NET or Swift, there's AppCode for Swift, WebStorm for JavaScript, there's RubyMine for Ruby, Goland for Go, CLine for C++. There's a lot of IDEs built on top of the same underlying open source IntelliJ uh, platforms. So all the things that you learn for Android Studio, uh, you can apply those also to other languages. So it's worth the investment and time in learning how to better use your tool if not only for your Android development, but also if you want to uh, move between different, different tool sets. So today I'm going to be using uh, the Canary version of Android Studio. Um, so you may know that they put out previews in addition to the stable version. Uh, right now 3.1 is stable, 3.2 is in, in uh, beta or release candidate, and 3.3 is, is in Canary. Now, for your day-to-day -day development, you may want to stick with stable because you're going to run into less issues. It's been tested by a wider number of, de of developers. But I will say that there's two main reasons to try out the Canary, at least um, uh, as a trial basis. You can install them both side by side, so you can go back uh, one to the other if, if the Canary is too un unstable for you. But one is to try out the new features and potentially provide feedback on those in the Canary. But the other, and I think probably more important reason is to try the Android Gradle plugin on your specific project and try Android Studio on your specific project in the alpha version. If you file a bug or you find something that breaks in your project with the new versions, um, in my experience, you get a lot quicker fixes if you report them in the alpha stage than if you're reporting them on the stable version. So even if you try it for a little bit and notice an issue, file the bug and go back to stable, um, it will pay itself off when they fix that bug and it doesn't make it into the stable channel. Um, and so basically you have them focusing on whatever is specific to your project and making sure that the upcoming tools work on your project, which means when it goes stable, you'll be able to use it day-to-day uh, -day for your team. So that is um, one reason to consider at least trying out um, the Canary channel. And when you're trying the Canary channel, one challenge that you uh, may run into is that the Canary builds and the beta builds require you to use the exact same matching version of the Android Gradle plugin as the version of Canary that you're using. So for example, today I'm using 3.3 Canary 6. I have to use 3.3, or uh, Canary 7. I have to use 3.3 Alpha 7 version of the Android plugin. Otherwise, it's going to complain and your Gradle sync will fail. So you have to keep that updated, but you also want to be able to use your same project and just go right back to stable if you run into any issues. So one way of handling this so that you don't constantly have to be editing your build files to change your Android, uh, your plugin, and then you accidentally commit that um, in your commit and you forgot to exclude it when you were um, committing your code, is to just have a flag uh, in your user level Gradle properties that says use the latest AGP Android Gradle plugin or don't. So you can just toggle that flag and then within your build file you can have both versions there and you can just have it guarded on that flag so that you can flip between the versions 
of Android uh, Gradle plugin without actually having to edit your build file. And this will make it easier uh, to switch back and forth between the stable version of Android Studio, which you might want to use day to day, but as the new alphas come out, you can try it, see if it works for your, uh, your project, file any bugs if you, if you notice them. This bug is one actually I filed that, and I noticed that sometimes it was always um, requiring you to use the alpha version and it wasn't even accepting the stable version. But uh, by design it, and when it's working properly, you either have to use the matching Gradle plugin or you have to use uh, the a stable version. So all the alpha versions should support all the stable versions. So you shouldn't have to use the alpha Gradle plugin but you want to at least try it so that you know if it's gonna cause any problems uh, with your project. So one of the very powerful things in the IntelliJ based IDED and really any tool is the key bindings. You can gain a lot of um, speed and a lot less distraction if you're not constantly having to use the mouse for, for everything. So putting in the time to learn the key bindings of whatever tool, um, but especially Android Studio or IntelliJ uh, is a good investment. By default, you're gonna get the Mac OS 10, 10.5 bindings. Um, there are other key maps. I recommend sticking with the basic ones, um, then that way the documentation will match up with more what you see. When you see people presenting on it, it'll match up more with what you're getting. If you really have um, a love for the key bindings of an older IDE that you used to work in, there are other options. Um, if you love Vim, there's even a Vim plugin. Um, Vim has a lot more than just key mapping, so you need a whole plugin uh, to do that, but I'm told it's uh, a pretty good emulation of what, of what you get from Vim. But I would recommend just uh, sticking with the, the default key maps. So one thing that you may notice if you have uh, one of the newer model MacBooks from the last couple of years is that a lot of functions in Android Studio require the function button. Now you can hit the function key and add that to your keystroke um, but then you have to do it differently when you're on the keyboard and you don't have the uh, regular keyboard and you don't have the function key. So there um, is a trick that you can do or a setting that is in a non-obvious place that you can actually show the function keys on uh, the, the touch bar. So I don't know if you can see, so you can see here, um, are you able to see what I have on my touch bar? So I'm gonna switch to Android Studio and you can see here that at the bottom there, my touch bar, has not the function keys, right? So if I wanted to do a, a command like find usages, which needs the alt F7, I can't do it because there is no F7. I would have to press the, the function key to get those and then I have to add one more key to my key combination. So what you can do is if you go into system preferences, and you go to the keyboard, you go under shortcuts, you go under function keys, you can add, and it actually says nothing about touch bar here, um, which may, is why it's a little uh, hard to find where this goes. You can actually come in and find your application and add your application to this list. And this list, anytime these applications are in focus, it will automatically show the function keys. Um, so now if I close this and I go back to Android Studio, now you can see my, that I have my function keys down here at the bottom. and so. When I toggle to a different program, I'll get any mappings that it has for the touch bar, but when I toggle to Android Studio, I will automatically get all the, all the function keys. So another thing that I like to do and that I recommend, and it takes some getting some used to, is to not use tabs in, the, in your IDE. And when I say tabs, I'm not talking about white space tabs, tabs versus spaces, I'm talking about the UI element uh, uh, of tabs. So what you can do, if you can see here that I have, let's see, a couple of files open here. So I have multiple tabs. So if I want to switch back to something I recently had open, I can move my mouse up here and I can click back. But as soon as you get lots of files open, this can get clearly cluttered. And then you can spend a lot of time just searching through this list of tabs to find the file um, that you're looking for. So one thing you can do is you can go to tab placement and you can either bring it up here as, as an overlay or you can go into the settings and search for tabs. And notice how I just searched for tabs here and most dialogues in Android Studio or IntelliJ, you can just type the thing that you're looking for and it'll filter through. 
uh, and which is much easier usually than looking through all of the submenus because um, they get more and more with every release. So if I look here, I'm going to, instead of saying place my tabs up at top, I'm going to say place my tabs none. So no tab, tab placement. So I do that. And you'll notice now I don't have that list of files up top. You might be asking, well, how do you find the files that you've recently edited? Well, there's a command, uh, command E that gives you a list of recent files. So you notice before I just had these two open because that's what I'd open, but I also have a list of files here that are the recent edit, recently opened files. And you can search through those. So if I want to look for my, the version stack Gradle file, I can just type versions. And by the way, the code that I'm using for this example is the, is from the architecture components Google sample repo on GitHub, um, with the, the GitHub sample browser, uh, from their repo. The other thing you can do with command T is just look at your edited files. So if you do command shift E, you get just the ones that you've edited. The other one was all the ones that you've opened. Command shift E gives you just the ones um, that you've edited. Um, and I think that just being able to pop this up and look at those and use the keyboard and even search through them like that by typing the prefix of the file will save you a lot of time over moving your mouse over all the tabs and trying to find where that tab went of a, pre of a recently opened or edited file. So in the newer versions of Android Studio, they've pulled in the newer versions of IntelliJ. And in the newer versions of IntelliJ, I think it came in 2018.1 uh, version of IntelliJ, there's a new view for the Gradle Sync and Build output. So if I do a Gradle Sync here, You'll notice that it comes up with all of these um, menus that you can open. And to find out like what's going on, one of these might be spinning, et cetera, and you kind of have to open them one by one. And especially as you get a big project, it can be really unwieldy to try to figure out what the status of your build is looking through this long list of things. So one thing you can do is you can come over here and say toggle view. And if you click this, it goes back to the older style list of just text so that you can just follow along, see what task it's running, and then you get down to the end and it'll say that. So you can also toggle that for the sync output, which is usually just configured successfully. Um, and it's usually much more what you're looking for, which what task is being executed and did it get to the end um, or was there an error? So I, I prefer having it toggled to the text view. You can always toggle it back, um, but I, prefer to leave it on the, the text, uh, text view. So Android Studio, um, especially with big projects, uses a lot of memory. Um, and when it's garbage collecting, if it doesn't have enough memory, it's going to slow down your editing and you'll notice it gets slower and slower. So you can give Android Studio more memory um, by going into help, um, edit custom VM options, and adding a JVM option uh, that um, will show you, uh, or that will give you the maximum amount that the JVM that is Android Studio is running on can have. Now, you don't want to give it too much because then it'll compete with your Gradle daemon and other things that are running on your computer for memory and cause other problems, slowdowns in other places. So you want to give it enough memory so that it's not constantly GCing, but you don't want to give it too much memory that it's competing uh, too much with other things on your computer. So like I said, you can come to help, and you say edit custom VM options, you add it there. The other thing that you can do is you can do show memory indicator. So this option down here, show memory indicator, is going to add a little, um, display down here in the very bottom of, An of Android Studio that shows you how much memory it's currently using. So I'll turn that on, I'll hit OK. Now you can see down in the bottom that it's using 742 out of my 3100 uh, 3, megs of memory. Um, and you can click on that and it'll actually force a garbage collection so that you can see kind of where your limits are. So you can monitor that over a little bit of time um, to see, you know, do I have too much memory? Does it ever get close to the 3100 megs? If it doesn't, then I'm probably giving it too much and I can lower that. Um, and try to fine tune based on your project size. Um, if you have a really big project, you're gonna need more memory. If your project is kind of small, you probably don't need 
um, quite as much memory. In the extreme case where you have a really big project, there's a thing you can do called unloading modules. I generally don't recommend this um, unless you are really having problems with indexing and other things. But if you, um, I use the find action to find that, that's load, unload modules. You can take, assuming you have a big app with a list, whole list of modules, you can unload them one by one. And what that does is that takes them completely out of the indexing, completely out of um, the pool of stuff that IntelliJ is looking at, which speeds up IntelliJ, um, Android Studio, and um, frees up some memory. But it's gonna cause a lot of problems when you're looking for things, doing refactorings. It's just gonna be unaware of that code. You can see now that the app uh, module is red here now. That means I unloaded the app module. Um, so anything when I search for code, it's not gonna show up anything that's under those directories. So if you have clean separation between modules, when you know I only need to work on this set of code and you have a huge project and I don't need to do anything with this other set of modules, this can work for you. But overall, be very careful with this because you can run into unexpected things where it's just not looking at half your project because you unloaded those modules. So I'm gonna come back here and say load all so that everything's back in scope there. So if you've been using Android Studio for a long time, you will have noticed that over time they added a new view called the Android View, and this is for the project tool window uh, that pops out on the side. Um, the new view has some advantages. Uh, it shows you things in a more logical way rather than the physical layout of things on the disk, uh, which can be useful, but if you are used to the old project view or you like the direct mapping of the way things are on the disk to the way that you're seeing them in your project view, the Android view can be um, a little bit unexpected. Um, so you can set that as the default for new projects that you open so that it'll default to the project view. And this is a tip I found on uh, a, a Medium blog, Margaret MZ. So if I come up here, I say edit custom properties, you would add studio.projectView equals true. And now, uh, when you open your project tab in a new project, you're gonna get project by default. You can still manually switch to the Android view, um, which groups things uh, in a more kind of logical um, way. It puts all your Gradle scripts together, all your resources together, which can be really useful, especially if you're looking across a lot of variants and you wanna see where your debug manifest is and your release manifest and have them all in one place. You might wanna switch to that occasionally. Um, but if you prefer project to be your default when you're opening somebody else's project or you're creating a new project, this will make it the, uh, the default for new projects. So you may have seen me use this before. Um, it's command shift A. And this allows you to search for anything that you can do in the IDE. You can remember that there's this thing that I could do, I saw it in a presentation, I can't remember what it's called, it allows you to search through things. And sometimes you just find things that you, know, you didn't know existed and you just happen to see them in that list. Um, so it's a very powerful tool for when you can't remember the, the keystroke for something. Um, oops. Yeah. So as you saw before, I searched for unload to get unload and load modules and I was able to just um, bring up that dialog through the, from using that. Now that doesn't actually have a key uh, binding by default. Um, so what you can do if with something that doesn't have a key binding is I can hit command enter, I think, control enter, alt enter. I can hit alt enter and that'll bring up a dialog to add a keyboard shortcut uh, right uh, there. So if I wanted to make that, um, let's say Alt Command M, which I think is already mapped to something, yeah, it's gonna tell me that it's mapped to something uh, for extracting methods, um, but you can just try different keystrokes until you find something that you think you'll remember and is unmapped. So uh, Alt Shift M is unmapped, so I could load it to Alt Shift M if I wanted to, and I can say okay, and now you can see that there's a key, uh, keystroke for load and load modules. And if you want to edit it again, you just go back and hit Alt-Enter, 
and it pops back up and you can change the keystroke. So um, that's an easy way to find things and then if you think you're gonna use them a lot, add a keystroke uh, so that you can access them more easily the next time around. Another thing that Android Studio offers is a view to show thumbnails of all the bitmaps that are uh, within a set of directories. This is useful if you are new to a project um, or you're looking for a set of bitmaps or you're wondering which drawables you need to use in which contexts. You can pull up the thumbnail view. The first thing you need to do here, it's grayed out because I haven't actually selected um, where I want to view the thumbnails. So first thing I'm going to do is select the project root, uh, GitHub browser sample. Then I'm going to pull up that. I'm going to hit show thumbnails. And then I want to show everything in all these directives or, uh, directories recursively. So I'm going to select them all. I'm going to hit uh, recursive. You can see I added a, uh, for illustration purposes, added a few Amex logos, but it also had the launcher icons that were in there. Um, and then you can double click on those and it'll bring them up and you can see where in your project hierarchy those specific um, uh, assets are. It's a good way to get an overview or find that one drawable um, that you were looking for. Another useful thing that's come in some recent versions um, through the IntelliJ upgrades is font ligatures. So what a ligature is, is when you have more than one character, um, you can have a font that will combine them into a single symbol, um, which makes it uh, easier to read sometimes. So often the dash greater than is used as an arrow, for example in Kotlin, um, when, you're, when you have a, a lambda um, that di distinguishes the uh, parameters to the lambda versus the body of the lambda. When you have a ligature, it looks like the bottom. It basically is replacing those two symbols for in, in the view with something that looks like an arrow. Similarly, for like not equals, which is uh, dollar uh, exclamation point equals, you can get that replaced with an actual equal sign with a slash through it, which may make it easier, easier to read. So to make this work, you need to get a, there's two things you need. You need a font that supports it, that has ligatures embedded in the font, and then you actually have to turn on uh, turn on the option. So there's two sources to get that. There's one called Fira Code, which has ligatures built in if you want to use that. If you already have a programming font, monospace font that you really like, you can uh, go to this ligaturizer and they have a script for adding in ligatures to an existing font file. So you can keep the font that you like, but also add these in. And they also have a few pre-built one of popular programming uh, fonts uh, available on that site. One other useful keystroke is when you have a lot of windows like this open and you want to just kind of uh, close them quickly, you can do Command Shift F12, and that closes all your windows. If you wanted to open back up, you can toggle your external tool windows um, with that. I'm going to open up a file to show you the ligatures here. So here's the code that I had in, in the example. And you can turn on ligatures by going into settings and searching for ligatures. And you'll notice that Fira code is what it is there. Um, I also have downloaded um, a different version of Inconsolato, which is a font that I like to use called Liga Inconsolato that has the ligatures added into it and then you have to enable font ligatures. So even if you have the enable font ligatures there, it's not, if there's none available in the font that it's being used, um, it's not going to uh, actually take advantage of those. So you can see if I turn off font ligatures, it goes back to having the separate characters. But if I enable font ligatures, it goes back to this. Now you can actually move the cursor through the ligature, so it's not actually one character. So in this case, if I put the character in or the cursor in between the two characters, I can still hit a space and then it just divides back up into the two characters, but as soon as they're next to each other, it gives you the nice uh, view. And same here, I can divide them up by 
adding the cursor in there. So it doesn't really inhibit your ability to edit the code in any way, um, but it gives you a nicer view. Of course, when you're doing pull requests and code reviews, it's gonna um, just show as regular text unless you have ligatures enabled there as well. So another thing that um, Android Studio gives you is the productivity guide. So the productivity guide keeps track of all of the keystrokes and features of the IDE that you use and tells you which ones you've used a lot of times, which one times you've ever used, and then it gives you a summary of each thing. So for here, go to declaration. I've used it over some time period 8,100 times, and then it gives me an example of, of what that is. Now, if I sorted it the other way, it's gonna give me the ones that I've never used. So maybe I wanna look through those and see why I have these IDE features I've never used. Maybe I'll learn one a week or something like that. Um, to improve um, my productivity. So this is a good way to learn about things that you aren't using uh, in the IDE. So I'm gonna go through a couple common uh, keystrokes, things that you might do already but you might not be using the keystrokes for. So one thing you can do in any context is when you have a sort of a, a sub-language or a DSL that's embedded within another language, you can tell IntelliJ about how to format and think about that code. So in this example, this could be a regex right here, I'm gonna do Alt-Enter, and I'm gonna come down and say, inject language. And I'm gonna tell it it's a regex. Again, just searching for regex so I don't have to look through that big list and I'm gonna do that. So now you can see it changed the syntax highlighting. So the syntax highlighting uh, will match whatever language it is. If you have JSON within XML and, and things like that, you can tell it that it's this language within that language and it'll give you the right code completion and syntax highlighting. Now that it knows that that string is going to be a regular expression, I can do Alt-Enter again and I can say check regular expression. So in this case, I need to add a space in there. So now I can see that that matches the regular expression above. So if you're trying to troubleshoot your regular expression, um, you can just pull it up, give a sample text. I can remove the numbers there. Now it doesn't match the backslash D in that. And you can um, make sure that uh, real quick iteration on your regular expression to match exactly what you would like. The other thing that you can do, once you've identified that this uh, piece of text is a regular expression, is you can say edit regular expression fragment. So this brings up a separate editor that will allow you to edit the regular expression in a way that it's going to add it back to your code but escape it properly for you. So in the regular expression, backslash s matches a string, but because this is Kotlin code, it needs to have double bash, backslash s. So you can see I just wrote the backslash s here, which is the actual regular expression, and it is smart enough to know that in the context where it's being inserted, it knows about Kotlin escaping, so it's gonna add it there. And similarly, if I add a quotation mark, it knows that this is inside a quote, so it has to add the quotation mark there. But when I'm editing the regular expression, I don't have to think about the, um, the language level escaping. It'll do that for you, depending on, on the context that you have. Another useful one that you've probably used um, and maybe not used the keystroke for is go to implementation. So here I can just do command B, um, which is the same as command click. So if you use command click a lot to go to the, uh, uh, the um, implementation of something or the declaration of something, I highly recommend using command B, which does the same thing. You just put your cursor on something, you hit command B and it'll take you there and it saves you from grabbing the mouse to do a, a command click. Then you can quickly go back to where you were with an alt command left. So I can do a command B to go in and check what is this thing that it's referring to and then I can quickly go back to where I was uh, with an alt command left and I don't have to use the mouse for either. Now that just took me to the interface where it was defined, but if I wanna see where it's actually implemented, I can do Alt-Command-B, 
and it'll pop up a list of one, the actual method in the interface, but then also the implementation. In this case, it's uh, code generated uh, by Room, I believe, um, but if I wanna see what the actual implementation of code that the code generation is doing, I can quickly navigate there and see that um, it's doing null checks, it has some synchronization, and kind of better understand um, what I'm getting out of that, and then I can quickly go back to where I was. Um, just to be able to dive in and go back to where you were is, is very useful. Let's see, oh, looks like my gradle sync had failed, okay. So another thing that you can use, similar in concept, is you would usually command, you could command click on a style to go see what that style actually is, but you can use command B also in the context of XML to go to the definition of that style. So I wanna see what that style is. This brings me inside the values file from at compat, and then I can dig down and continue on, and I wanna see what the parent of this is, so I can do a command B um, on the parent able to find the definitions. Doesn't look like it's actually wanting to find those. But then you can go back, and that's an easy way to debug what things are referencing out to. So again, that go to implementation it works in Android context, works in XML context, it works in Java, Kotlin, but even other languages if you learn these keystrokes, the idea of going to the declaration of something um, persists across all of these. Kind of the opposite of that is find usages. So if I wanna find, the thing is declared right here, it's uh, it declared as a name ID, but I wanna see where is this used in my code. I can do Alt Command F7, and that will search for all the usages of this in my code base. So I can see it's used in XML, I can see it's actually used in code, and I can go there, and if I wanna go back to the XML, I can just do Alt Command Left to go back right where I was. Another thing you can do is if you need to make multiple edits that there's not really a great other command that's gonna help you with these multi, multiple edits, you can do a, uh, a multi-caret um, selection. So let's say here I wanted to replace these int types with long, I can do control command G, and you can see that that selects all three places. So I can remove all three places and I can edit in three places in once and just replace them all with long, and then once I want to get back to one cursor, I can just hit escape, and then back to, I'm back to one cursor. In a similar way, you can do column select, which kind of gives you multiple, again, multiple cursors. Um, and column uh, select is command shift eight, which allows me to select all of this, so if I wanted to edit in a column mode and make these all vars instead of vowels, I can select them and just type var and edit it that way. You can also move sort of syntactically or semantically through the code even when you have multiple uh, cursors. So if I use alt, I'll go to the end of the symbol. So you can see how they all go to the front of the symbol, but I can all go to the end of the symbol, the beginning of that, and back. And if I want to just select that, I could rename all these variables the same, which of course doesn't make sense, but I can name them all foo. And just even though they're different sizes, I can easily select different size of amounts by using uh, uh, Alt-Shift to move one word at a time and then just type to replace this. You can see that in multi, this is another context where Android Studio knows the context of what you're doing. So this is a data binding uh, reference. So the same command B here will work to get me to the definition of repo, which is a variable. And I, if I wanted to see what type of repo that this is uh, describing, and then I can go right back to where I was uh, with alt command left. Another useful one is extract variable, which works if you just have an expression. But one of the cool things is, is if, if even if you select within a string, so if I select just bar within that string, and I see bar is in three places here, but I want that to be a variable, 
I can select just that. I can do Alt Command V. It will ask me if I want to replace everything. I'll say replace all three occurrences. And then it's smart enough to take that out as a variable and add the string concatenation there. So it removed it from the string, but it's smart enough um, to actually do something that's still going to compile and, and meaningful. So it's kind of extracting half of an expression there. It's extracting things out of a string. Similar in Kotlin, it knows about the language. So you can do a similar thing, but it's going to do something that is smart and kind of the right way for that language. So the same keystrokes apply. And this is just an example of where you learn the keystrokes once, but it's going to help you in multiple um, scenarios, even when you might not have all of the details of that particular language down. It's still going to um, kind of do the right thing and help you learn the language across the way. So I'm going to, get, again, here, select bar. And I'm going to do an Alt Command V to extract. I'm going to say replace all three occurrences. And then you can see here what it did was it extracted a variable called s. But instead of doing a plus concatenation with the variable, it knows that Kotlin has string templates. So it just puts a dollar sign s into the string itself. And if you're new to Kotlin, that might not be readily apparent, but just because you are re readily apparent, but just because you learn the keystroke and you apply that key same keystroke in a new context, you might learn that now I can use uh, string templates in Kotlin. Another useful thing, and I've been doing it um, already, is syntactic select. But that allows you to easily expand the selection just using alt up and down. So down minim, uh, reduces the selection uh, by one level, and hitting up increases the selection by one level. So if I just want to get the, the attribute, I can hit alt up a couple times. If I want to get the whole tag, I can do it a couple more times. If I want to get it, the data, uh, the whole data tag, I can do that. If I went too far, I can just uh, go down, uh, press alt down and go back to the previous selection. Now, once you've done this, you can move this around as a block. And it, it's aware of the syntax of the type of file you're in. So it knows that it makes no sense to put this variable tag in the middle of this other variable tag. So when I put it down, it moves the whole thing down and moves the whole other variable up. And similarly, when, I go, when it goes down to data, it knows that it wouldn't make sense to put the data in the middle of my variable selection there. Um, because that wouldn't be valid XML, so it moves the whole thing for me. So I can move it in and out of levels um, using command uh, shift up and down to move statement. That same sort of uh, movement, you don't even have to have it selected, will work in scenarios such as this. Let's say I just needed to uh, reverse the order of these parameters to this uh, data class. Well, there's a uh, annotation on it, so I would have to move that. I have to worry about the comma at the end. If I move this one down, is it going to bring the comma with it? And now I have to move the comma back up if I just want to swap these two things. Well, if I just put my cursor there and I do a command shift down, it's smart enough to move the annotation with it. It left the comma up there, and it just swapped everything one for one. So it's one edit, and I can move it right back up with that. So it's smart enough about the syntax to move it up and down. And again, this is something that can thank you, this is something that can serve you well across multiple languages because if you don't know the exact syntax of how to move things around, it's going to help you learn that and help you do it for you and save you the time as you're moving through languages, even just between Java and Kotlin. So I've gone through just a couple samples of keystrokes today. Um, but there's a many, many uh, keystrokes to learn, so I recommend you take a few, learn them, practice them intentionally over some period, a week or two, and try to add them to your normal um, uh, programming practice. There's a plugin called Key Promoter X um, that you may have heard of that will tell you when you did something with a mouse that you could have done with a keystroke, um, and it even will track statistics on that um, sort of thing. So I have it installed here. And you can see it has a missed shortcut hit list. So you see, for, for whatever reason, I really haven't gotten used to hitting Command F8 to toggle a line breakpoint. So I manually add a breakpoint like this. And you can see it comes down here, and it tells me you know, 
I should feel bad because I just keep doing it with my, with my mouse, right? Now, if I decided that I'm never going to learn that keystroke and I want it to stop bugging me, I can say, don't show me this again. Um, but it's probably something worthwhile to learn since apparently I add a lot of breakpoints manually using the mouse. Um, the rest of them, not quite as much, but apparently I, I, I like to click on the log cat to open the log cat. So this is kind of a hot list of things that you can see of like where you're spending your time using the mouse. So you can uh, go through this top list and pick a few, learn those keystrokes, um, et cetera. Key promoter will also look for things that you're doing that don't have keystrokes, and then it'll, um, it'll suggest you want to add a keystroke for this and give you a nice little um, link in the bubble to add the, the keystroke. So if you're interested in learning more uh, keystrokes, I definitely recommend you check that out. One thing that I've uh, I found useful is uh, in Android Studio is using the built-in Git integration. So often, before I open a PR, I want to make sure I'm not committing things I didn't intend to commit. Um, I'm only committing the files that are logically part of, of that commit. So I'll use the diff dialog. I'll do a command K, which brings up the commit dialog. And then I'll do command D, which brings up a diff of all the files that are potentially going to be committed in this commit. And then what I can do is I can use F7 to just go through one by one each change, even multiple changes in one file. Shift F7 takes me back to the last one. So I can go one by one, review the changes, see if they make sense. Did I really mean to switch these two um, fields? And if I did, you can, as you go, annotate your commit by, by telling the reason why you swap those. So you can kind of take notes as you're going through the diff, give a good commit message, and this commit message is, um, stays there while you're going through the diffs. If you, if you didn't mean to do it, obviously you can just hit this, and that'll undo the change. Now the files are identical. But sometimes you'll hit uh, change, like this one. Maybe I would like line endings, an extra line at the end of my file, but I don't really want to clutter up my current uh, PR with that extra line. So maybe I want to do that in a separate commit. So what I can do is I can uncheck just that line. So the change stays in my local directory, but it won't be part of that commit. So this allows you to commit just parts of files if you want to group them into uh, logical commits for easier uh, code review. I think that's probably all I have for today. Thank you.